tonight um, we're starting off on a, uh, on a new series which will be um, introduced by Simon uh, on Theosophy and its Fundamentals. Uh, this is the introductory uh, session to Theosophy in the 21st century. So, um, we're all concerned about, uh, well, asking the deeper questions in life. Otherwise, probably we may not actually even be in the Theosophical Society because one of the key purposes is to find out and investigate ourselves and the unexplained laws of nature. Um, so as part of that, um, you know, we come to a place, an organization where um, as members, we're inquiring, we're investigating into existence and ourselves. And I remember as a young man, um, I was 22, this is before I actually joined the society, I was had a bit of what should we call it inner unrest, where um, uh, I'd been having, uh, you know, thoughts coming up about what, you know, what does it all mean? Um, so what I wanted to ascertain first, and I started going to a new age bookshop, um, John Sell is a, a past member of the society, he's passed away, but his um, son Richard is a chair of the board. He, him and his mum ran a little bookshop called Goody's Bookshop in High Street in Auckland. And I would go in there and I would look at books on, um, written by in the 1980s by the doctors, uh, Raymond Moody, um, about, for example, describing their patients and how they had out-of-body experiences. Because what I wanted to do was in the first instance was to establish if consciousness existed independent of the physical body. Because I thought if that's the case, then it's actually going to have an impact on how I live my life. And one year later, I was in the TS. So, um, you know, these questions about who we are, what we're doing, are kind of fundamental. And I think of, um, if you've been to the Hamilton Lodge, most of you probably have, as you enter the door at the entrance there, there's a Hindu prayer. And I'll just recite this for you. Om Satoma Sat. Gamaya Tamasuma Joti Gamaya Mritama Mritangamaya Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So this is from the unreal, lead me to the real, from darkness, lead me to light, from death, lead me to immortality. And I remember as a member of the Hamilton Lodge and president there. Um, I always used to read that, and um, Sonia will know that as well, um, and welcome our members to the lodge. It was really, really good. So this prayer is a question to why we're all here, what does it all mean, and is there, a, is there answers to those questions? So in a sense, there are three kind of approaches humans have had throughout the ages to answering these questions. So the first, in a sense, is... Um, religion. So obviously um, you have a, a particular teaching, you have a particular religious uh, figure um, who lays down some, uh, or not as the case may be, does some teaching and its followers create uh, and write down texts um, and, and from that a religion comes about. So you have this idea of an authority figure, for example, you have Jesus who had reached uh, an evolutionary peak in humanity where his consciousness was one with the divine and he could speak from a sense of authority where um, uh, as opposed to based on his direct experience as opposed to faith where you might uh, not have that direct experience but have a faith that there is something there nevertheless um, and you know we can live how we apply religious teachings to our life um, you know, there's a difference between our attitude and how we live versus the religion per se. And um, as you will all know, um, you know, religion can be interpreted dogmatically or it can be interpreted in a very open-minded way. So it's about how we actually live. And for myself lately, um, I've been having a look at uh, Ravi Ravindra's book, uh, The Yoga of the Christ and the Gospel According to St. John. And it's very, uh, very, very good. Um, I recommend if you haven't had a look at it, it is in the library to have a look at it. And 
Ravi has said that gospel is one of the most mysticals of all the gospels. Um, and the way he goes beyond the literal interpretation of the stories is very, very inspirational. We've been finding that really quite fascinating to go into. But it's also interesting to note that in terms of religion, the Mahatmas have said that Christianity over the last 2000 years has done more harm than good, primarily because there's been that literal interpretation um, and that's been hard. But what I found, for example, with reading Ravi's book, um, you can get beyond that literal understanding and get to something deeper, some mystical insight. So um, in some, some cases for many people, religion uh, uh, can be interpreted uh, literally, or you can go a little bit deeper and go beyond the symbolism to something more uh, insightful. So that's the first kind of approach we've had in answering those questions. So the second approach then is philosophy. Um, and philosophers were essentially searching for truth. They were looking into what was real, as we said in our Hindu prayer. Um, and they talked about philosophy as a training for the soul um, uh, in the deeper sense, but also, you know, uh, you have a lot of um, philosophers who talk about the moral and ethical uh, side of life. Um, uh, but also philosophy was thought about um, and philosophers thought themselves as lovers of wisdom. So for example, uh, we all know in the Kita Theosophy in our motto, um, lovers of truth were from the Alexandrian philosophers called Philolithians. Um, and this related to our eclectic theosophical system started by Ammonius Saccus, which relates to our motto, which religion higher than truth, which June talked about at the start and introduction. So we've got a really a philosophical uh, basis for the formation of the society, but it's also more than that in the sense that as part of the you know, finding out who we are, you know, Socrates said, you know, man know thyself. We have to know ourselves inside and out to find out what is real and true. Because as we've um, talked about in the previous session, um, and particularly when um, I talked about um, meditation with Jeffrey Hodgson's Yoga of Light, unless there's that purification, that innocence of mind, that innocence of heart, you know, we're going to have problems knowing ourselves because Jesus was one with the with the Father, and he was devoid of all sense of egotism. So in knowing ourselves, being a good philosopher, we have to have that capability to look at ourselves objectively um, without any sense of egotism clouding our judgment. Uh, so uh, philosophy is the second um, approach to answering those questions. Next. So the third approach then is science. Um, and it's interesting there, you know, we're looking at um, science and, and how we've got a lot of technological development. So it's very, very useful. Um, you think of, for example, then you think of the 1970s, it's in the bag show with old Selwyn Toogood and later with, uh, who was the other guy that did it? Um, yeah, they did a remake of it. Well, you know, imagine winning a washing machine in the 1970s. That was a great big thing. That was a good technology to have in your house. Otherwise, you'd be putting it through the ringer. Like I, my mother used to do when I was when I was a child and we got told not to put our hands in the ringer. Um, you know, so technology has its advances. We've got all these smartphones, etc. Although you don't remember as many phone numbers as you used to before the uh, on, on development of smartphones. So you know, science has its um, uh, has benefits. However, um, Max Planck, a German theoretical physicist, said science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature. And that is because in the last analysis, we ourselves are a part of the mystery that we're trying to solve. And if you think about what Kim Ju said last week, this is about consciousness, you know, trying to define consciousness. Who am I? And science has not been able to define consciousness, primarily because you can't. Um, that is a mystical experience where there is, um, you know, there's the dew drop slips into the shining sea, as they say. There's no observer and there's no observed. There's just that. So consciousness, um, that inquiry into consciousness, you know, science really ultimately can't solve that. But it's interesting because HPB in the Secret Doctrine, which is a synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, she talked about, um, you know, she talked about quantum physics essentially, um, you know, and she made a point 
because uh, this was written, Secret Doctrine written in 1888. And she made a point then that, you know, in a few more years, the death knell to material science would be, um, you know, come down. Um, you know, it, there would be nothing more uh, material science would have had its day. And as we know, quantum physics has proven, ex proven exactly that. So science has its benefits, but ultimately, again, it's only one piece of the puzzle, like philosophy and religion. Then we get to theosophy, which is essentially an integrated approach, um, you know, a, a synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, and, and provides us with a really, really good framework to weigh our experiences on, to look at um, you know, how we can frame up our life, what is, gives it to meaning, what um, we're able to use as a point of comparison. Um, now, Colonel Olcott said we're all students quiring into the nature of reality, um, and we're exactly that. And we all compare our um, experiences, for example, and the fact that we've had such fantastic um, participation in our Zoom meetings points to what we talk about in the TS as a theosophical worldview. We have members from different parts of the world who share that common experience through their own investigation, their own study. And this mirrors at our level what the Mahatmas themselves do at their level, which is they compare the nature of reality to what they experience. Um, and they're limited. They, they also have a limit to what they experience at their level. So they know that at their level, life is one. They know what realms of nature they can operate in, but yet, compare them to the Buddha and they will say the Buddha is far, far, you know, more aware and has therefore different experience of nature, different experience of reality. So um, theosophy allows us, to, gives us a framework to, you know, um, put out a judge and compare and think about our own experiences uh, uh, of reality at whatever level we're having them. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's really good. Uh, society formed in 1875 um, you know and it's quite fascinating because it's the first time in modern history um, that all of this information has been under one roof one umbrella shall we say prior to that it was all hidden particularly for the west and if you remember in the formation of the society and particularly when Colonel Olcott met HPB and then the years Prior to that, there was a lot of spiritualism going on, a lot of manifestation, phenomena, etc. However, there was no coherent framework upon which to hang it, which theosophy provides. So uh, it's interesting as well, and you may know, um, that there was a discussion by the Mahatmas with their bosses about whether or not to start the society in 1875. Um, because they didn't know if the world was ready for it, and it was an experiment. And we're still carrying on this experiment, you know, 144 years later. Um, and you know, during during the formation of the society, there was it was said additional secret work going along beside the formation of the society. So it's interesting. You have a public experiment by the higher powers, which we're participating in. Um, I think Sushma's called it, you know, it's the it's the master's uh, uh, office, the master's organization, and we've got jobs in it at whatever level we're at doing the work. Whereas there's other work which has begun in secret alongside it, which has to, if you like, not be experimental, but rather I feel has to actually occur. So um, there are those disciples, if you like, doing that work. So we've got our opportunity in the TS to do our work, whereas other, um, you know, our other fellow human beings, dependent on their evolution, have other opportunities for service and work that has to actually happen in secret. Uh, so it's it's very interesting, and also, you know, every hundred years in the last twenty five years of each century, it's said that a spiritual impetus is given on the planet. So. 1875, you could argue we had the TS. In 1975, we've got similar organizations, which as a result, if I may say, 
on the fact that the TS was formed, you know, 100 years earlier. So you have the Institute of Noetic Sciences, so that's 1973, a couple of years before 1975. You got various other New Age movements as well, you know, and it's been said that HPB was the mother of the New Age. So the TS in its formation and what it was actually doing and what we're doing today is very, very relevant. Um, and, you know, the work that we're doing has an impact on, on the world as a whole. You know, and this is the beautiful thing in terms of our lodge premises and, and other branches who have their own premises. It's a center of force from which the masters can pour down the energy through. So whilst we're getting together via the internet, you know, this energy is still being generated and coming into our homes, essentially being connected via this platform. So whatever means is actually we're using to do the work, um, the masters and the higher powers are there with us, supporting us. So that's the great thing about the TS, that it provides a focal point um, for energy, energy to be brought down into the world via the service that we do. So this is a quote from um, The Key to Theosophy by HPB. So I'll read it out just in case you can't uh, see it. So it says, Theosophist, the wisdom religion has ever, was ever one and being the last word of possible human knowledge was therefore carefully preserved. It proceeded by the ages of the Alexandrian Theosophists, reached the modern and will survive every other religion and philosophy. Inquirer, where and by whom was it so preserved? Theosophist, among initiates of every country, among profound seekers after truth, their disciples, and in those parts of the world where such topics have always been most valued and pursued, in India, Central Asia, and Persia. So what HPB is getting here is that theosophy, which is separate to the Theosophical Society, it is the organization through which theosophy is promulgated uh, in an undoctrinated way, without authority, freedom of thought. Theosophy per se has always existed and will always exist, this wisdom religion. Um, and why that is, is because the inner life of the human being, of all life, is, is directed by divine intelligence, of which we are part. And ultimately, we are playing our part by engaging in the work of the society as part of that brotherhood, if you like, that great white brotherhood, that group of individual souls who are working for the benefit of humanity to um spiritually uh, evolve so it's evolution and consciousness as you know i've said uh, as bill has said about jeffrey hodson it's a movement from unconscious to conscious perfection so life is um evolving consciousness is evolving um as kim ju was alluding to uh, last week and you know we are actually taking part in that as every initiate as every aspirant as every person of open heart and open mind has ever done throughout the ages. So we're actually continuing on the work that HPB is talking about here that has been continued by previous philosophers and spiritual uh, aspirants and saints, etc. throughout the ages. So theosophy has always existed because the people have always existed to propagate it. And we're part of that uh, group, which is great. Next. So, um, I'd just like to, so, so essentially, um, you know, HPB brought in a modern presentation, Theosophy Under One Roof in the TS. However, as you can see by some of the names here, Krishnamurti, Ramana Maharshi, Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra, the Dalai Lama, Ravi Ravindra, you know, these are all our modern day, uh, some that I've thought of, you probably obviously can think of others who are carrying on the work um, of promulgating the ancient wisdom, this wisdom religion. Um, but I'll just do a quote from what HVB said. I haven't got it on the slide, but I'll read it out to you. Um, as you had in the start of the secret doctrine. But to the public in general and the readers of the secret doctrine, I may repeat what I have been what I have stated all along, and which I now clothe in the words of Montague. Gentlemen, I have here made only a nosegay of culled flowers, 
and brought nothing of my own but the string that ties them. Um, so that's from volume one of the Secret Doctrine. So what HPV was getting at here, as we talked about previous in the previous slide, is she's just brought together what has already existed um, and has always existed. Um, and you know, brought it together as part of um, for for the work as a synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy. Now you remember she wrote um, Isis Unveiled, which was similar work, but the Mahatmas wanted a, an updated version of that. So essentially, they asked her to put together the Secret Doctrine. Um, so it's bringing this information through, which has always existed, into modern form. And if you think of all the world's traditions and religions, that's exactly what's been happening for the people of the time. In our time, where um, there's been a shift, if you like, from mere blind faith to more intellectual understanding and inquiry, bringing a synthesis, if you like, of the mind and the heart, the head and the heart, human beings today, and particularly those in the Theosophical Society, need a more integrated approach where we look at things from a philosophical, scientific, and religious perspective without any kind of um, intermediary, if you like. Um, I know Bill has said in the past, it's about direct experience. So we can find out that indeed, as members of the society through our spiritual practice, we are indeed one with all through our direct experience, through our meditation, study and service, as opposed to relying on it from an intermediary for a priest, for example, and faith, which is not to say that those services are not valued. However, for the souls being drawn if you like to the Theosophical Society, they need something a little bit different. Um, and I think HPB said, you know, the, the secret doctrine was for those souls. Okay, next. So the secret doctrine, which we've been talking about a little bit, has three fundamental propositions and that essentially a framework for how we live. Um, and HPB said before you delve more deeply into the secret doctrine is to have a good grasp of these fundamental propositions. So we'll go to the first one next. So the first one is about unity. There is one absolute life, which um, we're all part of. Um, it's a finite and an eternal cause, a root without root of all that was, is, or will be. Um, and HPB talks about it as beingness and is beyond all thought or speculation. Um, so, you know, we're all part of this right now. And as Kim Ju again said last week, consciousness is not in the body, but rather the body is in consciousness. The air around us, the trees, the chair we're sitting on, the technology we're looking at, all of this is in consciousness, which is fascinating because then we can think about, okay, if we're all really one, we have to behave like it. So, you know, the old Christian tradition, do unto others as uh, they would do unto you. So, you know, in our, uh, our, our invocation at the start to unity from Annie Besson, again, about that unity of life. So having this perspective and applying it in one's life can save us a lot, a lot of trouble, as we'll get to, and when we see this in the second and the third fundamental propositions, because you know, combined they give they give us a framework, a good base to to figure out how we need to live. So you know, if we're all one, we're going to behave in a nice way to each other. If we have that, you know, that experience and that realization, this is the test for us all. It's part of our spiritual practice is to have that experience of unity, because how else can we go beyond distinctions of culture, gender, or ethnicity, unless we realize that we are indeed one to some degree in whatever form we may experience it. Okay, next. Okay, so the second fundamental proposition talks about um, periodicity or cyclicity in nature. Um, so Manvantara and Manifestation and Pralaya and Rest. Now HPB talks about this as, you know, day, night, light, dark, rest, um, activity. So, um, you know, this is again pointing to how we live. So I've put a little quote there, as you'll know, don't burn the candle at both ends. Try it, 
and do it continuously, even if you're young and healthy, your body will get tired. Um, so it's about having a regulated lifestyle, um, you know, which enables you to do your study, do your service, do your meditation. Um, and, you know, the benefits of that are self-evident. You have good health as, as a general rule. Um, you know, you have a calm mind, your emotions, you know, serene, you're quite relaxed. You can get on and do quite a lot. I think, I remember C.W. Liberty said, a, uh, a sad heart but tires in a mile. A happy heart can go all day, you know. So um, having a, a balanced approach to how we live, you know, um, gives us the energy to do the work. And that work is, of course, that self-transformation. Part of that, you know, energy is to is to go into ourselves. And that does take um it does take energy hence it's required you know to have a nice um a, a good diet you know uh, no meat no alcohol do regular beneficial exercise all of that um have that uh, an equilibrium in one's life to give the energy to go within because it does take quite a lot um so the second fundamental proposition points towards that um ordered way of living rest and activity okay next So the third fundamental proposition is, um, you know, it points to the law of karma, um, that uh, we are one with the divine, the essence of our nature, the monad or the spark, we're sparks of the one flame, the universal soul, and that through um, the cycle of necessity uh, or cyclic law through reincarnation, um, you know, we we evolve and grow in consciousness, you know, and this is the beautiful thing because nothing is ever lost. You know, I've got a mate I was talking to this afternoon when I had a bit of a tea break, um, lunchtime, um, you know, he just thinks there's one life and that's his point of view and that's good. However, if we can have a different perspective and think a little bit more, then we don't have to jam it all in. We can think about things in a different way we realize that whatever we do in this life, nothing is ever lost. And that's, you know, whatever effort we make is with us always. However, whatever barrier we remove in our mind and our emotions and our hearts to what prevents us from seeing what is real and true, from unity and experiencing that unity, then we have that, you know, forever. And we're born with those tendencies in the next life. And this is a beautiful thing about and the karma of coming to the Theosophical Society because we actually have an opportunity to ourselves grow, but in the service of humanity and sharing what we know with others. And that's the whole, you know, uh, what the more you teach, the more you learn, um, and the more, more you wake up and more you have deeper experiences and perceptions of unity. So, um, you know, the universal law of cyclicity um, helps us to, you know, grow and realize that nothing is ever lost. So, you know, thinking about everything as a whole, um, it provides us with a really, really good framework on how to live. And I 